your spirit travel while your body stays in the same place? And if we're already talking about it, can your spirit travel while your spirit stays in the same place? Yes, it gets that weird when you're talking about non-physical location. And if we're outside the physical, is location even a thing? Is there spiritual space? And if you, like thousands of people report, suddenly find yourself outside your own body, how do you move? Do you have to push your spiritual feet against the spiritual ground, or is there a better way to get around? Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg and Life. I gotta start this one off by saying this is how to travel in the afterlife, not how to travel to the afterlife. I probably should not say this because there might be people signing on who think, oh, this is going to tell me how to induce an out-of-body experience and we want you guys to watch so that we'll get more minutes to watch. But I'm telling you now, we, we're not, we don't know how to get there, <laughs> but we know once you're there, should you ever find yourself there, this is how you maneuver. But it's, it's going to be worth your time. Please just give it a shot. My name is Curtis Childs. I'm the host, and this is put on by the Swedenborg Foundation, which is a nonprofit working to get Swedenborg's ideas and those similar to his out into the conversation. Get your questions and comments in. Have you had an experience of out-of-body travel? I've heard statistics that uh, an insanely high number of people have had some kind of spiritual experience. So we want to hear from you. What was it like for you? moving around and see if it lines up with what we have to say here today. So you may not have had any kind of spiritual experience, but you may end up having one. You might want to know how to navigate. And as we're going to see, this navigation is not just for these extraordinary experiences. This is talking about the way that our thoughts and feelings work in life right now. So who wouldn't want to learn about that? Let's take a look first, part one. Our first bit of advice is don't believe everything that you see. And this is something that you can go by in the physical world. Not everything is exactly how it appears to the senses. But also, according to Swedenborg, that's how it is in the spiritual world as well, which you would think if the physical is a reflection of the spiritual. This is from his book, Secrets of Heaven, 1376. And you can download these books, as always, just click that and you can get your hands on a free ebook or free PDF. Swedenborg says, I have often talked with spirits about the idea they have of place and distance. They're not real, I tell them, but only look as though they were. On the contrary, space and distance are just changes in the state of your thoughts and feelings, which make themselves visible this way in the world of spirits. There is no such appearance in heaven among angels since they have no concept of space and time only of state. So there you initially have a, you have a couple of features in that quote that I want to point out. One is that you're seeing a distinction between what Swedenborg calls the world of spirits and heaven. The world of spirits is sort of the waiting room of the spiritual world, meaning he says that's where everybody goes initially as you sort of get sorted out and come into your deeper self, who you are. But then there's heaven, which everybody's heard of heaven. So heaven is this destination kind of place you get to. He says that in the world of spirits, it sort of seems like there's space and time, even though there's not, but in heaven you can tell what's really going on. He also mentions that distance has to do with states of mind, which is the primary focus of this episode, and we're going to get to that more. Uh, but also, he says that there's, that there's an appearance that there is space and time, which might lead you to think, well, if that's how the spiritual world is, is it just ethereal? Is it, uh, you know, not, is everybody just sort of walking around in a haze of illusion? But before you get too much despair about that, we have plenty of illusions in the physical world too that we live with, and they don't detract from the experience or make it any less real. For example, the horizon line, if you're just sitting there, it looks like the world ends, what is about seven miles if you're standing. Uh, but we know it doesn't. It also looks like it's something you could fall right over, but that's just a trick of the curvature of the earth. Speaking of the curvature of the earth, if we're on this side, it would seem to you, based on what you know about gravity from the experience, that if someone on the other side of the world would fall right off the bottom. But 
We know that's not the case because of gravity pulling towards the center. You don't think of the ground as towards the center because it's so vast, but there's this, there's this whole uh, pull towards the middle effect that makes something that would seem impossible at first thought possible. Uh, let's take the senses and their input. You hear something. If you are hearing something for the very first time, you wouldn't be able to tell how far away something is. We only learn that things like echo and, and pitch indicate distance through experience. Normally, I mean, without that, we would think that whatever was making sound was right close to us, right in our ear, Swedenborg even says. Same thing with vision. If you didn't know anything about the moon, you would probably think, oh, that's like um, maybe it's 30 feet across and it's 400 feet in the air. And things like stars can appear smaller, even you actually can have fun with appearances and feel good about just knowing this is not really what it seems like. For example, maybe you've seen the, the rotating wheels, optical illusion, look in the middle, and then whenever you move your eyes, look at those wheels. They look exactly like they're spinning. We know it's a static image, we promise, it's not a video, But and, and I know right now my eyes are tricking me, but it doesn't make me think, oh, I can never trust my eyes. I just know in this particular instance, they've been compromised and they can be. So we know how to navigate the world and we're comfortable with those illusions and it's fine and it's fun. And we've had to learn how to navigate those illusions in order to operate in the physical world. Distance, we know that even though something can look small, it might just mean it's far away. And we had to learn that in order to just not bump into things. So we have to do the same thing if we want to travel spiritually. We have to learn the nuances of spiritual illusions. And we wanted to know also, we get these reports from Swedenborg about how the spiritual world works, but as I was going on and on about in the beginning, all these people report out-of-body or spiritual experiences, are they encountering the same kind of thing? So we had an episode a little while ago called Modern Spiritual Experiences, where we, uh, in, we had a good conversation with author Graham Nichols, and we wanted to get back to him because he reports having these out-of-body experiences on a regular basis, and we wanted to know what is moving like for him, and is there any similarity in the movement that Swedenborg describes? So we're going to have his interview here. Well, you, know, you know the internet. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't as well as it should. So there's a couple going to be a couple of pauses in his interview. We made sure it didn't skip any major points, but just don't worry. It's not it's not you, it's us. So here's what Graham had to say. Well, I can I can start right from the beginning because early out of body experiences, I I think I had that sense that it was more like a physical experience, and you needed to travel from point A to point B. And I remember I spent a lot of time in the early experiences trying to perfect this ability to move from one place to another. And what I would find is as I even tried to go across the room, I would maybe drift in a particular direction or, or another direction. It was almost like there were there were tides of, of energy or almost like the ocean and the, and the, and the waves are pushing you in a particular direction. It felt very much like that. And for a long time, I tried to work to sort of overcome that that feeling of being uh, of drifting off in a different direction. But but I think as time went by with the experience, I realised that really, when you let go of the physical, you let go of being attached to this sense of being physical. Um, the physicality in the experience dissolves away and you become more and more able to move fluidly so um, over time for example uh, I was able to leave uh, a particular location around my home for ex in the early experiences I couldn't go very far because I had this very closed sense of where my physical body was and where my reality was in a way how reality worked but over time that dissolved away and then I was able to pass and basically function more like a spirit and, and I could move um, much further away and then eventually started to have experiences on completely other levels altogether more the initially maybe the summer land type levels that Swedenborg talks about and then even beyond that where any sense of the sort of physical seems to dissolve away so I think it's a there's an evolution in the way you move and interact with the with the world around you in that other level. 
He said an important step in his evolution was this letting go of the sense of physicality. So he's sort of detaching from the earthly mindset. And Swedenborg wrote as well that earthly mindsets are prone to believing appearances and taking them as truth. And this can hamper us. This is from Secrets of Heaven 1376. So spirits who have physical and earthly ideas clinging to them believe that the situation really is exactly as they see it. It is almost impossible to lead spirits like this to believe anything but that they are still living in their bodies. They refuse to be convinced that they are spirits, so they are almost completely unwilling to hear that any kind of appearance or fallacy exists, preferring to live in their illusions. In this way, they shut themselves off from understanding and acknowledging anything true or good that is too far removed from their misconceptions. So we have to be, we have to at least not get too rigid. Swedenborg again and again says rigidity, mental rigidity causes problems because if we clamp down and say, this is the way it is, and I'm not open to anybody educating me further about that, uh, we can't be forced out of that. And that, that can cause us to miss out on the sort of the, the big picture and all the good stuff that's planned for us. So, if we're able to let that go and be taught, even so, it's not like you immediately can navigate everything spiritual. spiritually. There is this learning curve, uh, and Graham described a little bit of what the process was like for him to be able to f- get more lucid in these experiences. Yeah, I think I think initially there was a certain degree of frustration because, like I was saying, I was trying to move in a particular way that maybe I'd read about uh, from other people who'd had similar experiences. Um, All the accounts I'd read gave the impression that it was so easy to move around and to go anywhere and you just need to put your attention on on where you want to go. Um, And I I sort of understood that in principle, but then actually practicing it uh, was was a lot harder. But once I did manage to go through the window to actually get out of the uh, apartment that I grew up in even that took quite a long time for me to get to that point when I managed to do that it was like a sort of mini liberation because finally I'd got to that next point and then yeah as it as it naturally unfolded step by step I, I found it more and more fascinating and I could experience more and more through through the state so fascinating, liberating. These are the kind of experiences we're looking for. And to get there, we're going to have to take a look at the core principles behind spiritual motion. And we'll see that as we learn about spiritual motion, we also learn about our own emotions and our own thoughts and how they change and how we can sort of uh, dictate where we head in that direction. All right, let's take a look at part two. The, the fundamental premise of spiritual motion, as described by Swedenborg, is that spiritual motion is essentially a change of state, that they don't have the same kind of three-dimensional space that we have here. There, it looks like it, like things, there's objects like there are here, there very much seems to be landscapes and layouts, but it's not distance its state, its emotional, mental state. He describes this in Secrets of Heaven 1379. When spirits walk or move around or go from one place to another, a frequent sight, it is nothing but a change of state. That is, it appears in the world of spirits as a change of location, but in heaven as a change of state. And there again, you see this difference. In heaven, you see things as they really are. In the in this, it resembles many other objects and events that have a representative meaning and that display themselves in visible form there. That there's sort of levels of meaning, and you get these, on these lower levels, you get the exterior displays of what are at higher levels, different kind of uh, the causes behind it. And, you know, he says that we here in the physical world are kind of the last level of that. So we are even representing the lowest things of the spiritual world here. That's a story for another day. Swedenborg got the experience of having these spiritual journeys. And during them, his body stayed in one place. And this is from Heaven and Hell 192, where he talks about it. 
All motion in the spiritual world is the effect of changes of inner states, to the point that motion is nothing but change of state. This is how I have been led by the Lord into the heavens and also to other planets in the universe. So there you go, in case you were wondering. This happened to my spirit while my body remained in the same place. This is how all angels move about which means they do not have distances, and if they do not have distances, they do not have space. Instead, they have states and their changes. We get a little foreshadowing there. This is the physical, spiritual experience, from physical to spiritual. You're in one place, your spirit is moving around. However, there is sort of a sub-phenomenon of this with angels, too, and we're going to look at that a couple sections from now, so just keep that in mind. One the the way that this whole principle breaks down in in colloquial terms is that how you feel about someone or something determines whether you're moving away from them or towards them. That is the basic premise of spiritual locomotion. And we actually did a short clip about this back when we were doing our series, the Swedenborg Minute. So we're going to give you one minute, uh, an overview class on how distance works in the spiritual world. So if somebody came up to me and they were like, how close are you to your father? And I said, oh man, about 640 miles. That's not what they're looking for, is it? They want to know how we feel about each other. Swedenborg wrote that a lot of the idioms we use, although we don't realize it, actually originate in our subconscious knowledge of how the spiritual world or the afterlife works. There, how close people are emotionally literally dictates how much distance is between them. So someone that you're at odds with ideologically and personally isn't just going to stumble across your path. You repel each other like opposing magnets. But if there's somebody you like and you both wanted to talk, they would suddenly show up at your door. This also applies to communities of people. Those who can live together in harmony are drawn by this principle into neighboring towns and cities, while those who would clash are separated by great distances. So in the afterlife, the people that you're close to, you're close to. You know what I mean? (sighs) 2014, we were so naive at the time. Heaven and Hell 193 takes this subject a little bit further. This being the nature of motion, what we just saw in the video, we can see that drawing near is likeness of interstate and moving away is dissimilarity. This is why the people who are nearby are the ones in a similar state and the ones who are far away are in dissimilar states. It is why space in heaven is nothing but the outward states that correspond to the inner ones. This is the only reason the heavens are differentiated from each other, as are the communities of each heaven and the individuals in each community. It is also why the hells are completely separate from the heavens. They are in an opposite state. And there you do get a reflection of, or something that is reflected in the physical world. People, I think, go a little crazy when they hear uh, religious people talk about stuff because... If you study the physical world, everything is run by laws, and there's a logical reason why everything shakes out the way it does, but then you get religious or spiritual principles, just, oh, everybody does this, but, but why? Why is there this? And Swedenborg makes what seem like these arbitrary distinctions in the afterlife. He says, there's heaven, and there are multiple layers of heaven, and there's hell, and there's multiple layers of hell, and they're separate from each other, and you wonder why. Is it like God is drawing a line, okay, everybody here has to go here, it's, it's an artificial thing. No, this is based on on the spiritual law, just like gravity or forces similar to that are responsible for why the universe is like it is, why matter is where it is, why things are differentiated. This principle that things that are that like each other draw together is what creates heaven and hell. Heaven is a mindset which is mutual love, and hell is a mindset which is, I don't love anything but my own gratification. Those are opposites, and because they're opposites, they repel each other, and this is where you get this striation. All these communities people are in, Swedenborg talks about, in heaven and hell, it's not because God is like, okay, I'm picking the teams, you have to go here, you have to go there. People who love the same things are pulled by the basic force of the spiritual world together. So that's how the whole thing works. It's interest and compatibility that draws us places, but can we get any confirmation of that? Yeah, we can. Well, we've talked before on this show to the founder of the Out of Body Travel Foundation, Marilyn Hughes, and we wanted to get her input again because she's having these experiences as well. And we said, do you see this principle at work? If it really is this universal spiritual principle, everybody who goes there should observe it to some extent if, they're, if they know what they're looking for. So here's what she had to say about that. 
So generally, if you want to go to a certain place or if you're, especially we're talking about afterlife in particular, and if you are thinking about your loved ones, you're going to more likely resonate towards those loved ones. In fact, it can go as fast as the speed of thought can go because it's very, very instantaneous, instantaneous. And so another aspect of this that a lot of people don't realize, I believe, is that because of those intentions and other aspects that I'm going to get into in just a second, we become vulnerable to literally going where we're compatible. And this is ironically part of why it's so important in our lifetime here to become conscious of what we are doing in our lives because the more we're prepared to cross over, the more likely we will go to a pleasant place because we go where we're compatible. In the writings of a lot of mystics, including Emanuel Swedenborg and my own, we have just resonate immediately. So that means you can be going to a higher space or a lower space. And um, so your, your intentions, your thoughts, what you're thinking about are all going to um, affect how you travel in the afterlife. When you're, when you're actually traveling in the afterlife though, um, it's gonna feel like you're kind of like traveling at the speed of light. It's, it's a flying, flying through the sky kind of thing. So what is that flying? And what, what makes us fly in one direction? And how can we give you the power of spiritual flight? Well, it has to do again with it, what, what Swedenborg describes in Heaven and Hell 194. This is also why in the spiritual world, the one individual is present to another if only that presence is intensely desired. So the, the, the fuel that this travel runs on there is not coal, it's intense desire. This is in person because one person sees another in thought the way, in this way and identifies with that individual's state. Again, change of state. Conversely, one person moves away from another to the extent that there is any sense of reluctance. And since all reluctance comes from an opposition of affections and disagreement of thoughts, there can be many people appearing together in one place as long as they agree, but as soon as they disagree, they vanish. And I think that that's kind of, that's kind of a cool way to have it. Isn't it? I mean, isn't that like something that feels like emotionally right? Like that's how it really should be. What do you guys think? Do you agree? Oh, no, you disagreed. So I've disappeared. You've disappeared at home, I'm assuming. We got to do the rest of this show. It's fine to disagree, but we got to do the rest of this show. So I got to find something we agree on so that uh, I can reappear. Oh, I know, I know. Can we all disagree that this is just a really clever way to show off this principle here? Do you guys agree? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Thanks for turning off your computer at this point. All right, let's take a look further. Heaven and Hell 195. Whenever people move from one place to another, whether it is within their town, in their courtyards, in their gardens, or to people outside their own community, they get there more quickly if they are eager to, and more slowly if they are not. The path itself is lengthened or shortened depending on their desire, even though it is the same path. I have often seen this, much to my surprise. We can see from all this again that distance and space itself depend wholly on the inner state of angels. And since this is the case, no notion or concept of space can enter their minds, even though they have space just the way we do in our world. So he's talking about an actual shortening of features in the spiritual world based on your psychological state, because the spiritual world is all psychologically based. I mean, that's why we are emotive, rational creatures, is because we're based in this world that's made out of that stuff. But we do see that popping up in our experience here in a subdued kind of way. It's not that we can shorten or lengthen a staircase based on how excited we are to get to the top, but it can feel like it takes longer or shorter. There's this whole sense of, oh, if I don't want to do something, it's going to take me longer to get there. If you don't believe me, we actually have video proof of this. So there's two two guys who help work on this show here named Matt and Stuart, and it was actually earlier today, I was calling a meeting because we had to do some production stuff for this show, uh, and you're going to see they have very different feelings about that meeting, and that actually can make it feel like a longer or shorter path to them to get to the top. So here's actually our security cam footage of that thing.
<laughs> for some reason that didn't that that was real that was not acting if for some reason that didn't convince you listen to psychology people have found that this is a real phenomenon it's called time perception and it's a things and we all know this that if there's something you like it goes faster and there's something you don't like time can slow down. You may be having a time perception experience right this very minute. For example, we're in the second section of our show, and you could be having this reaction to the second section of the show. Uh, you could be saying, hey, you know what? We're watching this. It's the second section. I feel like this. Uh, you're happy. It's only the second section. Wow, this is great. I hope there's a lot more. Or you could be this guy. It's only, oh, it's only the second section. Two reactions, the same show. It's just going to go on forever. Both fully legit reactions. Uh, and if you if you want to look more up uh, about time perception yourself, you can. There's a there's a lot of websites you can find it on. Here's one that's kind of cool. Exactly what what is time dot com. So check it out for yourself. Um, but your your beliefs about things can really affect the experience of them. If you believe that this is a boring show, watching an hour plus of it is a grueling experience. Believe me, I know. Um, and so we find in spiritual experiences that same principle plays out. Beliefs, your beliefs about how fun the goal is can sh shorten a path. It can change also just the way that you get around. And this was further from Graham talking about his experiences. Um, well, pretty much universally, most people feel that distance and travel happen simply by putting your attention or your focus onto where you want to go. Um, it usually happens in the form of almost, almost like a teleportation or something like that. Often it's that you simply find yourself at one moment in one place and in the next moment in another place. So it can be that. Uh, fluid that it's just a switch from one place to another or in some context like a, a feeling that you're you're actually traveling there more like a physical feeling you might get a sense of speed and uh, moving through space and things like that but I think the deeper you are in the experience the more likely that you'll simply just go there I think a lot of it's to do with your with your own belief system in a way if you think of yourself very much as a physical being and you have the uh, pre-assumptions that you that everything works in a physical way then you might have that that movement uh, experience but if you let the what it is which is essentially non-physical then usually you'll just instantaneously go there because there's no real sense of distance or, or limitation in that state so we're trying to arm you with the right beliefs. If if the correct, if the most accurate beliefs let you move the most freely, we're trying to do that. But is is that always? Is this just a very niche program for people who are having spiritual experiences? No, I mean there is the concept that we're all going to go there eventually. So it might be nice to pick up some pointers. But this is a this is a dynamic that's playing out as we said in our thoughts and feelings right now. We are actually spiritual travelers now, regardless of whether we're having experiences, and we're going to look into that in part three. So thoughts are not limited by space, just like sight is not limited except by objects, meaning you could see, there's, there's no limit to how far you can see, especially if something is giving off light. We can see stars that are quite far away, and if the conditions are right, you know, we can just see this amazing distance, and if we have, you know, the right instruments, we can see farther still. Uh, that's the way that thought is if it's not obscured by spiritual things. And there's this correspondence between sight and thought, that sight is a physical analog to the process of thought. They work together. This is Heaven and Hell 196. We can illustrate this by our own thoughts, which are also devoid of space. For whatever we focus on intently in our thought is seemingly present. Then, too, anyone who reflects on it realizes that our eyesight registers space only through the intermediate objects on earth that we see at the same time, or from our knowing from experience that things are a certain distance away. 
is because we're dealing with a continuum. And in a continuum, there is no apparent distance except by means of discontinuities. This is even more the case for angels because their sight acts in unison with their thought, and their thought in unison with their affection, and also because things seem near or remote and things change in response to the states of their deeper natures. So we can we can pick up on this phenomenon a bit by looking at physical analogs to it. For example, let's say we wanted to look up into the universe like I was just talking about. We'd have to be aware of the seeing conditions. Uh, so there, if you're an astronomer, you, you use various terms to describe how much, how easily can you see out into space? What obstructions are there? And let's say that we were going to pull out our telescopes. What kind of things do we have to watch for? Uh, we have all kinds of things that can affect vision, especially when you're doing it with the kind of precision you need to look out into space. How much light pollution is there? How close are you to a city? Is there dust in the air? Are there clouds, air currents, temperature, weather fronts? All this stuff is physically important if we're going to see out into the heavens. And on a spiritual level, if we're going to think about these heavenly concepts or understand these deeper truths about life, this spiritual stuff that we're looking up towards, we have to be aware of our earthly thoughts and earthly emotions, as well as our moods, our beliefs, the truths that we do understand and apply, and our affections. All these form sort of our spiritual seeing conditions if you will. And Swedenborg talks about this further uh, in this little clip we're going to play for you now. Those who have the light of wisdom in their intellects are like people standing on a mountain in the middle of the day, clearly seeing everything below. Those who have an even higher light are like people with telescopes who can see things off in the distance or far below as if they were close at hand. Those, however, who have defended falsities and are therefore in the faint, deceptive light of hell, are like people on the same mountain at night, with oil lamps in their hands, who can see only what is nearby, and even then can barely make out vague shapes or tell colors apart. So not even just how well you can see, it's where you're looking from. What's in your mind vastly changes where you are in the spiritual world. And it can inhibit your ability to move and to understand. And that we had Graham describing an experience where some of his own mental chatter was holding him back a bit from movement. So here's what he had to say. Initially, I would try to move very fast. Um, and what happened was as I moved very fast, if I moved with a thought in my in my mind, for example, I want to go to, I don't know, the next street, for example. If I moved very, very fast, it, it stopped my thought processes getting in the way because I think uh, my rational mind and my, my mental chatter, if you like, was limiting the experience. So if I did something like uh, move very abruptly, spin, or or just move very, very fast. It it helped me to, to out of my sort of thought patterns. And then when I stopped moving, I would find that instead of being in the location that it's, I'd actually shifted to another place. So that was how I essentially learned to do it. But then with practice, I just got to a point where I just put my focus on it. The way I could describe it is it's something like if you have an intention to go somewhere, say you're driving down the street or, you, or you're or you walking somewhere and you're going to turn at the next corner, what people do in this kind of experience is they try to imagine everything um, where they want to go. Now, if you think about doing that while you were walking down the street, you would probably find it very difficult to imagine the detail of the buildings and the and the road and it would actually get in the way of you just walking down the street and going where you need to go so i think essentially it, it got to the point where i just naturally um would focus in a similar way to as if i was going to a physical location and then i would shift from one place to the other and that's a little example of the that we're actually exercising our spiritual muscles now on earth because to act to move in his experiences he had to simulate 
what it's like just to be walking on earth. Not the physical part of it, but the intention side. Where, how, what it actually feels like to be wanting to go somewhere and putting yourself in that direction. And all of this stuff is applicable now that, you know, we're talking about being up on mountain, spiritual mountains, but really this is, this is the same thing for your understanding of life in this world. The more that you, uh, I mean, the more that you have these higher principles and make sure you clear up the stuff that's in the way, the more you can be, uh, have this illumination in this world. And even in this world, we are part of a spiritual community. So we, we have a body and a spirit. I mean, you're, you get some people who say there's no spirit, but out of there, there's a huge slice of people that say there's at least a body and a spirit. Well, if there is, where's the spirit right now? You know, is it in like one of those um, storage lockers in the spiritual world? You know, those things you pay a dollar and you have this, like, okay, you have your space in, in heaven or somewhere where your spirit is. Your spirit is a citizen of the spiritual world right now. And Swedenborg says we're actually in communities in this life, and we're moving from community to community. We're not even staying put. And what moves us? Well, it's just what we've been saying. It's what do we care about? What do we think about that's actually causing us to get up and find new housing from place to place? He talks about this in Secrets of Heaven 1277. The case is similar with people on earth in regard to their souls, which are always tied to some community of spirits and angels. We on earth have a position in the Lord's kingdom too, and it likewise depends on the character of our life and on our state. It makes not the slightest difference whether some of us are far apart on the planet, even if the distance is many thousands of miles, we can still be together in the same community. If we exercise kindness in our lives, we are in an angelic community. If we fill our lives with hatred and similar qualities, we are in a hellish community. Similarly, it does not matter in the least if a large number of us live together in one place on earth. All of us are still individuals when it comes to the character of our lives and our state of mind, and each of us can be in a different spiritual community. When people who are several hundred or several thousand miles apart appear before the inner senses, they can be so close depending on their spiritual location, that they can sometimes touch. As a result, if several people were to have their inner eyes opened on earth, they could congregate and talk together, even if one were in India and another in Europe. So each and every person on earth is immediately present to the Lord, directly under His eyes and His loving care. We're choosing our neighborhood. We're choosing our neighborhood right now. We're like doing Zillow of the Spirit. And we can be thinking about that. Do, do, do Think about what I'm thinking about and what I'm feeling right now, what I care about. Is that going to put me in community with the kind of people that I want to be in community? Do I want to be around people who are like this? That can be the compass that, that dictates what we what we care about in this life, and by that, where our spirits are hanging out. And we can also be working on growing spiritually closer to the people that we're around, because the more that we are positive toward people, the closer we can get spiritually. And Swedenborg goes further into this in Divine Providence 29. In the spiritual world, all union takes place by means of attentiveness. When anyone there is thinking about someone else because of a desire to talk with her or him, that other person is immediately present. They see each other face to face. The same thing happens when someone is thinking about someone else because of a loving affection, but in this case the result is a union, while in the former case it is only presence. This phenomenon is unique to the spiritual world. The reason is that everyone there is spiritual, It is different in the physical world, where all of us are material. In this physical world, the same thing is happening in the feelings and the thoughts of our spirits, but since there is space in this world, while in the spiritual world there only seems to be space, the things that happen in the thoughts of our spirits come out in actions there. And I mean, that's that's fairly intuitive, but that last line is a kicker that what we're thinking and feeling comes out in actions there. So we are we are citizens of the spiritual world and we affect the spiritual world based on how we think and feel here. So I mean, we obviously affect each other 
physically doing that and emotionally and psychologically. But here's another, in case that's not enough of motivation, you know, you got your spiritual reputation to uphold, right? So before we get into complaints that this show is not weird enough, we know that that's part of the promise of the experience. So we're going to crank that up significantly in part four. Everything physical is a reflection of something spiritual. This is what Swedenborg was very, very adamant about. Is he right? Well, if he is right, the physical, if the spiritual is weird, the physical should be weird. Is the physical weird? Yes. I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. Check this out. Uh, This is the phenomenon of quantum entanglement, and it's weird enough that it disturbed even uh, Albert Einstein. Entanglement occurs when a pair of particles, such as photons, interact physically. A laser beam fired through a certain type of crystal can cause individual photons to be split into pairs of entangled photons. The photons can then be separated by a large distance, hundreds of miles or even more. In quantum physics, entangled particles remain connected so that actions performed on one affect the other even when separated by great distances. The phenomenon so riled Albert Einstein that he called it spooky action at a distance. Did you catch that? that, that that's, like, that's like Harry Potter. You can, if these two particles have this event together, then suddenly they're connected apart from space. So weirdness established, and I'm not going to make any conjecture about if that's there's something spiritual there. I don't know. But we've established our physical weirdness. In the spiritual world, here's a few things that are a little bit strange. There's, it seems there like people change places. And you would think, hey, there's, yeah, there's a lot of places. People go places. And so that makes sense. And he, Swedenborg describes that happening, Secrets of Heaven 1381. Souls and spirits who have not yet been allotted a permanent position in the universal human travel to different places. That's such a Swedenborg in first sentence. It's the universal human, uh, check out our show, The Shape of Heaven. Now here, now there, now they appear on one side and now on another, now up, now down. They are called roaming souls or spirits and resemble fluids in the human body that travel from the stomach, sometimes into the head, sometimes to other places and remain on the move. This is how these spirits act before they arrive at their designated place, a place suited to their overall state. It is their state that changes and wanders in this way. So it seems like, you know, just forget all that human body stuff. That's not the weirdness we're concentrating on. We're concentrating on, it seems like the spirits are moving around. However, Swedenborg says, that's actually all an illusion. Secrets of Heaven 1378, I have learned both by talking with angels and by personal experience that spirits are, as spirits, are not in the place they appear to be. So far as the organic substances composing the spiritual bodies they have are concerned, they can be very far off and still appear in that place. I realize that people who allow illusions to fool them will not believe this, but it's still the fact of the matter, which is him hedging like, I know this is going to be weird. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to read this and shut the book right here, but I'm telling you, this is how it is. So let's return to that diagram we had before, now this is all happening within the spiritual world. That this There's some kind of spiritual substance, spiritual organic substance, he says, that makes the actual spirit. But the avatar or something of the spirit can be projected and appear all over the place while the actual home base is not moving. And Swedenborg saw this phenomenon played out in a particular way by negative or harmful or evil spirits, where he said he would see a spirit and that spirit would suddenly be appearing all over the place. As And it was an, he saw the intention of it was to give the impression, oh, I'm everywhere. Like, I'm, I'm omnipotent or I'm not, you know, I'm all... Uh, omniscient, omnipresent, I can do anything. And they would try to do this. But Swedenborg says that he found that that they're not actually in those places at all. It's just a trick of the senses, of the spiritual senses that they do. So this is Secrets of Heaven 1376. A change of location is nothing more than a visible manifestation or else a trick of the senses. Changes of locations in the other world are of two kinds, you see. One involves the fact that all spirits and angels keep their same place in the universal human at all times, which is a visible manifestation. The other involves the fact that spirits can appear in a place when they are not really there, which is an illusion. To recap, we're going to use a couple of 
lower thirds, which is the most high tech graphics that we have. So there's two kinds. For let's, there's the illusion spirits can appear to be somewhere there where they're not actually located. But then there's the visible manifestation that there's a, there's a home base or there's a uh, foundation or an essential place where you always are. And you can, you can travel from that and you actually are there and you really do experience that place just in a just as real a way, but you are not really there. I mean, the, the true you, the, the, um, the essence of you, that's not where you're native to. Uh, so he goes on, Secrets of Heaven 1377, to describe this a, a little bit further. All souls and spirits whatsoever from the beginning of creation appear in their own positions at all times and never change place except when conditions inside them change. As conditions inside them change, their relative location and distance alter too. So it seems to me like there are two different kinds of movement. There's like, I can go around and visit and do things, but then there's the essential me, and that only moves when who you are as a person changes. That's this spiritual relocation. When what you care about, what you think about, when when you, you know, here, when who we are is changing, that's when our spirit moves, when the home base moves. But if we have this primary location where we are, what is that relative to? I mean, if there's not really space, what dictates whether we're near or far or up or down? What's the central focus? Well, I'm glad you asked, and Swedenborg put it this way. In regard to spirit's position in the world of spirits, an angel's position in heaven, angels are on the Lord's right, evil spirits on his left. In front of him live people of a middling sort, at his back live the malicious. Overhead are the vain and ambitious, underfoot are hells that provide a counterpart to them. So all individuals have their own position relative to the Lord, in every quarter, at every height, on the horizontal plane and the vertical, and at every angle in between. Everyone's place remains fixed, never changing to eternity. So there, it's God. God is the, the divine, is the stick by which distance is measured. So it's about your relationship to the divine that determines where you are, and it's based on sort of this governing state that we're all in. This is Secrets of Heaven 1377. Each spirit has a general governing state, though, and the particular and the highly specific states still relate to this general one. For this reason, all spirits return to their position after such changes. So, if it all relates to God, that is the relationship we need to be thinking about if we want to really be able to navigate the spiritual world. And that's important enough, we're going to give it its own section. So let's take a look now at part five. It may be that this is all simple and making sense to you. It may be that it's confusing. And if it is confusing, uh, that's because we think physically. We can't help it. It's very hard for us to not have some sense of physicality in the way we think. And Swedenborg describes this in Heaven and Hell 198. We can see from this that even though there is space in heaven as there is in our world, nothing there is evaluated on the basis of space, but only on the basis of state. Also, spaces there cannot be measured the way they can in our world, but only seen out of in accordance with the state of their deeper natures. That directions are meaning there. Directions have emotional potency or, or, or meaning to conscious individuals. An example of that would be, we did a show called The Spiritual Future of the Human Race. Uh, and if you want to check that out, there's a, a representation of the New Jerusalem in there. This is in the book of Revelation. And you, if you've ever read that account, there's like length, width, and height. The city is equal and all those. Those dimensions are psychological traits, or that it, it's essentially that, you know, love, wisdom, use are all the same. So these, these distances all have spiritual meanings. And the best way to truly uh, experience this kind of stuff is to let the divine 
at least guide the experience. And Graham was saying, he uh, near the end of our interview, said that he, to- he was talking all about how you can try to move around and make it so you can go where you want to. But really, the best stuff happens when you just let go and let it happen. I think the most profound experiences on a spiritual level often happen when it's nothing to do with your intention, in a sense. It's when you decide to allow the experience to unfold naturally and allow that guidance uh, to come through the experience, whatever that whatever that might be, depending on your beliefs, etc. But allowing the experience to unfold naturally has always been when I've had the most spiritually uplifting and spiritually profound experiences. That's what we want. Uplifting and profound, that's what we're trying to head towards. If we can work with the flow, you know, hopefully we can get those. And we can actually we travel around from place to place spiritually, but once we have found our true place, we can go deeper and deeper into that. If we return to that graphic we had before, all these positions are meaningful, you know, and they all had to do with how much love is in your heart. You know, you have, he talked about, if you're below, it's because you have this antipathy toward the human race. And Really, the, Swedenborg says the heart of providence is God is trying to guide us to a good spot. And if we let that happen, then we end up in our place and we can really start to contribute and be where we were meant to be, where our destiny is. And it's our work on earth in this life that lets us really travel not only to where we need to be, but higher within that spot. It's, you know, don't think about it as some spots are higher or lower, better or worse. Within each of our spots, we can go higher and higher. And Marilyn was describing how important our work here is in being able to travel upwards, which is a universally good direction in the spirit. Another aspect of this that I thought might be interesting uh, for your listeners as well, that one of the other reasons why purification is so important in this particular lifetime and that we do not ignore that process is in my mystical experiences I've been shown many many souls who were too heavy to be lifted up to higher realities and elsewise other entities that were so so tranquilly light that they would just And the reason why this is important in a lot of respects is because the weight of our soul will determine a lot about where we go. The lower realms, the heavier your soul, the more sin and other types of things you're holding on to, vice, your, your soul will actually be heavier. The less of those things, those things that you actually work through in this life, your soul becomes lighter and more able to go higher. And this is so extreme in the sense that, you know, many times I've been taken into lower realms, purgatory or, or hell, hellish realms, and the, the soul that I'm trying to assist cannot be helped out because they're too heavy. They have to lose some of that spiritual weight that's holding them down down in this place. But to keep that in perspective as well, so people don't get too fearful, God is always merciful and he is always reaching out towards any soul that actually tries to take the next step. We are in that spectrum of creation and our soul evolution, there will always be the moment you have a thought of going higher, God will send an emissary, whether it be an angel or otherwise, to try to make that possible for you to take that step higher. And that happens whether it's it's in this realm where we live or below or higher. So um, it's always important to remember the mercy of God because whatever you're on, can be changed in an instant by one single thought of uh, reaching out to God for his help. He says that there is that accessibility to God because God is outside of space. So no matter where you are physically or spiritually, because in physical space or in spiritual space, which is wherever you are in terms of your thoughts and feelings, the divine is present. This is Secrets of Heaven, 1382. People on earth cannot help confusing God's infinity with with infinity of space. 
And since their only idea of spatial infinity is that it is nothing, which is true, they also fail to believe in the divine infinity. A true picture of God's infinity is instilled into angels by the consideration that they can come into the Lord's presence in a split second without any intervening space or time, even if they should be at the ends of the universe. It doesn't matter. There's nowhere you can be, and this is true, of course, physically, but spiritually, there's, you can't have gotten so low that you can never call out to God, that you're, that you're beyond help. That's not the way it works. That's not the way omnipresence works. We can open up and we can be drawing closer to God. If God is this fulcrum or this center point for all movement in the spiritual world, we can be coming home. We can be moving towards the center based on how much we come towards love. And we're going to look at that in a second. I just want to add that angels, they get better mental capacity the closer we they get to God, and we can get the same thing. This is Heaven and Hell 199. The essential first cause of all this is that the Lord is present to each individual according to that individual's love and faith, and that everything looks near or remote depending on His presence, since this is what defines everything that exists in the heavens. This is what gives angels wisdom, since it provides them with an outreach of thoughts, which in turn affords them communication with everyone in the heavens. In a word, this is what enables them to think spiritually and not naturally." the way that we do. So they get this upgrade the closer they go. So how do you get into the presence of God? What does that take? Do you have to be on a special sort of list? Do you have to sign up early? What do you have to do to get into God's presence? Well, we have a little slideshow for you. Here's like a few simple quotes about, because it's not just like walk, where's God? We'll walk and find God. Spiritual movement is a change of heart and mind. So you have to become like God, to get there. And these quotes show what that means. The Lord is present where goodness is welcomed. It's not about, uh, you know, necessarily holiness or religious practice. You know, the, the core of it is love. God is love. And the more that you move towards love, the more that you love love, that's how you move towards God. And that's a good deal for everybody involved. So that's what we're encouraging you to do today. That's our show. Hope you liked it. Hope it gave you a sense of how to move around. And if you wouldn't mind, move your physical hand to the like and subscribe buttons uh, on the bottom of your below this thingy here. That would help us out a ton. That helps this shoot out. This helps this, you know, thinking about if I'm going to make a bunch of these little moving puns, but this really, this is how you move on the internet. If you like and you subscribe and you comment and you support this channel, that lets YouTube know, oh, these guys are like relatively cool. So we're going to show this to more people. And then some people see it and they might think, oh, that's not, I don't really care about that. But other people see it and they think, I really... I'm glad that I found this. So it could be because of you that someone finds it. So please like and subscribe. And if you want to make it possible, help make it possible for programming like this, independent, whatever this is, Swedenborgian programming, to exist on the web, this as a curiosity even, you could consider making a donation because we are a nonprofit and that's how we go. So here's a little more about that. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving to give. 
If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. In thinking about the questions, I did just get this little surge of excitement here because, or just like, oh, that's going to be fun because I, I haven't seen these questions before they pop up, so I have no idea what we're about to talk about. Let's see. First question. Lexi, can people experience anything good in hell? For example, if a married couple went to hell, would they still faithfully love each other, or does the atmosphere of hell tarnish any good feelings? That gets a little bit into what is hell. Um, hell is a deep-seated opposition to love. Hell is a pleasure in harming other people. That, you can't really love another human being when that is at the core of you. You know, and if, it, if it's not at the core of you, if you just have some external gruffness, but inside you really can love somebody, um, then you're not going to get, you're not going to pull yourself into hell. So it would, according to Swedenborg, you can't, if, if you don't have any good of mutual love in you that would keep you out of hell, you aren't really going to be loving a partner. Like if you did have an attract, you could have an external attraction to someone, but it's not going to last. It wouldn't be. I don't know if that could happen, that you have two people who actually love each other. Love meaning, I care about this person's happiness. Not like, there's plenty of couple hellish relationships where, you know, some, one partner is controlling the other partner or they're just using each other. But, but to actually have love, meaning I want to make you happy and I'm not doing it for myself uh, and I, I want us to grow closer and, and do good together, that... If you've got that, I don't think you're going to be going into hell. So I don't, I don't know if that um, situation would exist. However, hell is a system. We did a show called The Good Thing About Hell, which I think if you haven't watched it, you should check it out. Um, because hell is designed to allow as much good to go on as it can. There is a process Swedenborg describes about if you're if you have devoted your if your purpose and your aim is evil and harm, you get these external good things you have kind of taken away because they would actually cause you a lot of anguish. But at the same time, hell is God is trying to bend people towards less and less destructive things. So there is there can be relationships. They're you know they're not as full. Um, and there's there's this element of backstabbing and that kind of thing, but God is keeping people as much in community as they can be held together. So it's not that, and it's not that you're not happy. There, there's plenty of times when people in hell are happy, you know, not like real loving happiness, but like gratified. God is not interested in people suffering, so it's only that He doesn't let them uh, harm other people more than within certain limits. I really think, the more I talk about it, you got to watch our episode. It's called The Good Thing About Hell. That describes that further. So those are my thoughts on that. It's a great question, um, and, you know, whatever, the answer has got to be something fair and, and good. So there's that. Let's look at the next one. Lisa, what happens if several people are thinking of you at once? Where do you go? Yeah, that, that would get into how there's not really time in the spiritual world. Uh, Swedenborg says there's not space and there's not time. And I don't know what that means exactly, but somehow there can't be, you know, there, there's time for everything. I, so, I sort of picture it as like, right now when I'm trying to schedule a vacation, oh wait, I have this thing on the 14th, so I can't go there. That It wouldn't be like that, so I don't know. Maybe you go ever, to all them at once, maybe it goes in sequence, or maybe it just doesn't occur to people to think of you at the same time. I don't know. Swedenborg doesn't touch on it, um, but I imagine something. And may, could you do sort of a, an experiment? Okay, let's have 50 people think about this person at once, and whichever person they go to wins 50 bucks or something. I don't know. Uh, it could be fun. All right, next one. Carolyn, if you love someone but the other person does not love you, will you still be close to him or her in the afterlife? I don't know. Swedenborg does talk about friendships where one person is 
uh, where the two people like each other, but one person is devoting themselves to evil and the other person devoting themselves to good and how that causes all these problems because they want to hang out, but they the, the good person suffers from the, the, the lifestyle of the bad, the person who's going in a bad direction. I don't know about this, if you're talking about like, unrequited romantic love or if you're talking about fam- like a family thing like oh, my my son doesn't want to see me or something like that i don't know how that works i'm racking my brain for any instances of swedenborg describing that it does seem like it needs to be mutual but then again it's not that that's the only way people can come across each other swedenborg describes people who had been killed, had been murdered in life, uh, confronting their murderers after death. So obviously, they're, not everybody wants to be in that situation. So there is a mechanism for meeting. It's not only that you, you never see anything you don't want to see. I would imagine there's got to be some kind of resolution that happens. Either you get taught why, okay, wait, you don't really need to feel attached to this person. Look, here's why, and you feel okay about it. Or you guys do develop some kind of friendship or relationship or whatever you're looking for, or there's something, there's got to be something because a lot of people suffer with that. So there's got to be some antidote there. Those are my thoughts on that. Next one, Zeke. I was just smiling because it's it's like I barely answer these questions. Zeke, is the spiritual world modern like our world, cars, planes, phones? Yes. Swedenborg says that everything that comes here uh, is a reflection of there. He describes traveling around. We did a show, oh, what was it, with the, with the two Londons? He talks about a spiritual world version of London, and the, the, that spiritual world version was just like the physical world one, enough to, to the extent to where when he was traveling in spirit, he went and asked them, do you have this particular kind of drink? And they had it. Now, everything there is going to be, have a different meaning, you know, like they don't need a, they don't need a, a plane to get somewhere, but there is this sense of vehicles because Swedenborg does talk about representations and some people do appear to be using them. Um, the point is, it's not like the spiritual world is stuck in olden times. Swedenborg, in his Journal of Spiritual Experiences, describes something which sounds very much like skyscrapers, which were not around then. He talks about these buildings that are so tall that you can't see the top of them. And he says, you can go, you can be inside them and go from house to house, which sounds a lot like apartment buildings. And he also says there are these representations on the walls, which I would think would be some kind of screen or something like that. So um, I I think you would, find, it's not like you would go there and it's like everybody has has no technology, like it's Amish or something. Although there's communities like that, there would be all the above. Swedenborg would, went and visited people who were living like they lived in the world in tents, you know, from, from long, long ago. I would imagine people from their era often keep their life with them, not that you couldn't shed it if you didn't want to. So yeah, there is this tendency to think of the spiritual world as like stuck in, uh, in, the, in the Swedenborg's time or whoever's time. But no, it's, it's more alive, more vibrant, more modern than what we even have here. Okay, let's look at the next one. Derek, can we use our spiritual senses on earth in our physical bodies? Yes. And there's a couple ways I want to say yes to this. One, you have Emanuel Swedenborg, who, who was able to have spiritual eyes, ears, everything opened, and so to experience both worlds at the same time, or sometimes travel into the spiritual world. But we did a show called Sensing Your Spiritual Body, which I think you should take a look at if, if you want to. Uh, uh, and it was all about how the spiritual senses are things we experience here. Remember earlier in the show, we compared sight and thought, that spiritual sight is understanding. So when we understand concepts, we are actually using our spiritual sight there. It's only by spiritual sight that we can understand something. And there's an analog to all of the the senses. So again, the show is called Sensing Your Spiritual Body. All right, let's do another one. Andre, what does the spirit look like? Spirit looks like a person. Swedenborg says that we are continue to have a human form after we die. He says that that initially we look a lot like we do on earth, but that begins to change as our inner nature becomes reflected in our outer nature. And depending on what we're like, Swedenborg saw horrifying looking spirits who were like right out of horror movies or like zombie video games. Uh, But then he also saw just amazingly beautiful people who had love inside them. So in, in general, a spirit looks like a person, but there's, there's a wider range there. All right, 
Let's do two more. Shelly, at night when I go out under the stars, I feel myself being pulled up to the heavens by my solar plexus. The Swedenborg speak of that. It started happening after my mom passed. I get a homesick feeling. Well, I want to say that that sounds like a potent experience to feel this connection with that. A couple of thoughts come to mind. Um, the heavens, you know, Swedenborg says that the, the stars are a correspondence of heaven. He actually has an experience with an angel where they're looking up at all the stars and they're saying, you know, the, in heaven, all the communities in heaven appear like stars. It's like in The Lion King when he says, is that our ancestors looking down on us? It's not that there's actually angels in those balls of whatever hydrogen and helium that make up stars, but there is... Um, those are a physical representation. Like what they are to our physical sight is what heaven is. So they're like a picture of heaven. So when we see that, we get this feeling of awe because this is like a like a portrait of heaven. So maybe you're connecting to that. They are the solar plexus. The body has all kinds of meaning to Swedenborg. I don't ever recall him describing a feeling like that, but uh, you know, it's obviously close to the heart. Um, and it could well be that this, you know, a spiritual feeling that you're having is manifesting uh, in these sort of ways. But I, as far as like the specifics, wh- why did it, why is it there? What does it mean? I don't know. I can just sort of guess based on what I've learned, but I appreciate you sharing your, your story here with us. All right, last one. Sean, does Swedenborg mention if spirits also visit the living just by thought? I believe he does. I believe the answer is yes, because he would, Swedenborg would sometimes, I'm remembering a negative experience right now where someone, a spirit was saying, who's the person who's been writing all these things about Swedenborg's books? Like he didn't like what Swedenborg was writing, so he was coming after him for it. It does seem like spirits can find us. Swedenborg also, I'm only thinking of these negative ones, so I wish I had a rosier picture to paint. I'm sure it happens on the good side too, but he does talk about there was a woman who hated him during physical life, and she had had died and then was trying to kill him as a spirit or something, so that these attachments don't just dissipate. And I would imagine on the positive side too, that's why I do think that our loved ones are are close by uh, in this life. I'm not saying perpetually, but that they can visit... um, or, or call us to mind and heart. And so I, you know, that's a great way to leave it because we're not just talking about ethereal kind of interest in spiritually stuff. We're talking about human relationships and we're talking about love and we're talking about the continuation of it. That's why this stuff really matters. And we're talking about learning about the system in which love is expressed and, and lives forever and has the potential to build community. Sort of the, the, the next chapter of love is this this spiritual world, and we want to be prepped for it, so that's why we're looking through these sources that we believe are reputable sources of information, and I would appreciate it going through this with you guys. Thanks for all your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all, and we'll uh, try to hopefully get to some of them. Uh, if you repost them under the video, we'll try to answer them the best we can. And we're going to look forward to hanging out with you all next week where we're going to explore the spiritual meaning of numbers. So if you ever had any interest in that, we're going to dig in there. And I hope to see you there. Talk to you later. Hey.